Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Bill, for reminding us about September 11th, the importance of that, and what a horrible day that was, and it certainly changed America as well. Always thankful for this month of September where we do have missions, right, because we get to give beyond our regular offerings to really support so many different places around uh, the United States and the world as well, so I hope you'll participate in that and be generous. We are continuing our study uh, on the theme of set your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ brings us. And if you just kind of, I'm sure all of you remember this, but this whole month, this whole year rather, I've been talking about the big three, faith, love, and hope. In fact, I gave a series, first part of this year on faith, then we followed up with, remember, the Max Cato, John 3.16 series on love. And then now we've been in this series on 1 Peter based upon setting our hope on Christ. And what a great way to live a life, to remind ourselves, Peter does, of all the wonderful ways that we can set our hope and fix our hope on God. And right now we experience a little bit of that grace, right? And what an overwhelming aspect God's already given us. But one day when our Lord and Savior returns, He's going to bring the full measure of what that grace means to us. And we want to be part of that. So when days kind of get down and things a little bit dreary or things not quite going the way you want them to go, uh, just remember that you have your hope set on Christ and that grace that he brings, and that, that's good. Which leads us to our theme today, and our theme today is out of 1 Peter chapter 3, and the theme is good days loving your life. Setting your hope on the grace of Christ means that you can have good days loving your life. I want you to think about that phrase for a moment. It comes out of Psalm 34 in which Peter gives us that phrase, for whoever loves life and sees good days. Any of you want a good day loving life? You know, some people struggle with this idea of even having, loving their life or having good days. So I, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. And this is what Peter tells us comprises good days loving your life. All of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil, their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Loving life, having good days. Let me ask you a question. How, how do you think our world defines what is good? What is the good life? When you think about all the ways that our world kind of looks at what a good life is, it's just a stark reminder of how much different it is than what we just read out of 1 Peter chapter 3. Some of you have lived long enough, including me, to have pursued things I thought was part of the good life to realize it wasn't so good. It's, it's hard. What does it mean to have a good life and to love life? You know, Paul reminds us we've got to be very careful how we live to make the most of every opportunity. We don't get a redo. We don't get a second shot at this. Everything we do has consequences. Every decision we make, every choice we make has consequences, doesn't it? And it goes into this. So Paul's reminding us, if you're going to live a life, live a life that's wise and not unwise. Uh, live a life that's good in the eyes of God and living a life that you're going to love your life. Just want, Do you love your life? Do you love the life that God has given you as a gift? Do you see your days as being good days? Now, I know you'll have bad days. I've had some bad days. I had a couple of bad days this week, right? But, but overall, when you look at your life, you'll, you'll say it's a good life. It's a, it's a life I'd love to live. You know, Jesus reminds us of this in John chapter 10, doesn't he? In verse 10. He says, you do realize that the devil's a thief. And what he wants to do is he wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life. He wants to destroy and kill anything that's good. He wants to take away your joy. He wants to harm your life. He wants to destroy your relationships. He wants you to hate your life. He wants you to look at your life and say, I don't like my life. 
I just read this past week that there are hundreds of people dying every year and every day in our country from drug overdose. It's an awful pandemic in our country. The amount of young people and old people as well that are taking their lives by taking drugs, a couple of hundred a day. I think about the rate of suicide that's increasing in our young people and throughout our culture. Our culture that has more than probably any culture that's ever lived on this planet. Our culture that provides so many things in life, all the stuff, all the possessions. Our poorest people are richer than most people in our world. And yet out of all that, there's this sense that it's not the good life. It's, it's a life that most people don't like. They're looking to escape. They're looking to do other things, whether it's drugs or alcohol or, or other ways to escape because they don't like the life they have. And Jesus says that's exactly what the devil's doing. He's stealing the goodness from your life. He is robbing you. He's destroying you loving your life. But Jesus says, I want you to know it's the reason why I'm here is that you may have life and have life to the what? To the fullest. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in Christ Jesus you set your hope on the grace in Jesus Christ? That you can have good days loving your life because of what Jesus has done for us. Now it helps me when I think about examples. And the Bible is very good about examples of showing me, well, what do you mean to hate your life? What, do, what does it mean not to live a good life? Man, I think of Ecclesiastes and Solomon. Did you know Solomon said he hated his life? Over three times in Ecclesiastes. I hate my life. We don't think about that, do we? We think about Solomon with his wealth and writing Proverbs and uh, his wisdom. And he talks, I hate my life. I hate my life. He indulged every, every impulse. He pursued every lust the world had to offer him. He selfishly withheld nothing from his life. He said, everything I wanted to do, I did. I participated in. He said, but the end result of that was, instead of bringing me goodness in life and loving my life, I hate my life. I hate it. Because I found that pursuit was chasing after the wind. It was vanity of vanities. And you think about the people during their time, they would have seen Solomon and said, oh man, look at how much he has. Look at the wisdom he has. Look at where he lives. Look at his power. Look at his prestige. Queen of Sheba at the time, who was very powerful and very influential, comes to visit Solomon. And she sees his riches and sees everything he has. And what happens is she is breathless. Her breath is taken away. It's meaningless to her. Solomon hated his life. Now you think about Solomon had the wisdom from God to write Proverbs about how to live a good day's loving your life. He was considered the wisest man. God gave him this wisdom and wealth. And yet, as the wisest man, he lived the dumbest life of all. He lived a dumb life. He did not take the wisdom and apply it that God had given him. So he could write Proverbs, but he couldn't live it. He could write Ecclesiastes, one of the most depressing books in the Bible, a manual of how to waste your life, how to hate your life. He says it's vanity, it's meaningless. In fact, in Ecclesiastes 5, he'll say this. Here's the real gift from God. The real gift from God is that God will give you possessions and wealth and then give you the ability to enjoy them and you will be happy in their toil. This is a gift from God. You don't pursue the things of this world and expect to be happy. You can't chase after the things of this world and expect to find goodness, to expect to find a life that you're going to love. Solomon says, no. What you discover is God has given you these things in your life. You enjoy them. You live for them. You live for him, rather. And God will give you those things and the ability to enjoy them. Three different times in Ecclesiastes, he says, I had everything. I pursued everything. I hate my life. It's not a good life. And three different times in Ecclesiastes, he says, God gives you the ability to enjoy what he gives you. Enjoy it because it comes from God. And you do that, you're not pursuing it. You're accepting it as a gift. And so when we come to 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter's talking about good days, loving your life. And he says it begins with an attitude. 
Now, I want you to know, as we read it earlier, we're going to go through it now. There's not one thing about indulging in your impulses, pursuing your lust, gaining things, having stuff, more and more of this, more and more of that. Nothing about good days and loving your life has anything to do with what the world defines what a good life and loving your life is all about. It's all about good days, loving your life, Peter says. It's about relationships. It's about your relationship with others, how you think and treat them. And it's about your relationship with God. He says, you want to live a good day and have a good day, rather, in loving your life, you're going to be having the attitude of living in harmony, like-minded, sympathetic, loving one another, compassionate and humble. This is the way you're going to think, and this is the way you're going to treat people on that day. And the days that you live this way with that attitude, it's going to be a good day, and you're going to love that day. You're going to love that life. Now, when I was reading this, and as you're looking at this, I think you realize that these are the attributes of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, correct? So in Philippians chapter 2, when Paul is talking about our Lord and Savior, in this attitude, he says, look, we have Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're united in Jesus Christ. He says, in that unity, then, we are tenderhearted. We are compassionate. We're like-minded. Uh, we have the same love. We're being one in spirit, one in mind. In other words, when I do these things with that right attitude, I'm living the way Jesus wants me to live. And so I'm looking at others in that relationship. How would Jesus treat that person? How does Jesus want me to think about that person? What is going to make a good day where I'm going to love my life today is going to be my attitude that I'm going to treat others the way Jesus treats me. That I'm going to have that attitude toward... Does that make sense? I didn't say it's easy, did I, right? But this attitude that it's all about... It's not how much did I make today or, or what did I buy today or what did I add to my stuff today. It's about how did I treat the people around me today. And if I treat them the way Jesus wants me to treat them, it's going to be a good day. I'm going to love that life. Now, Philippians 2 says it takes a lot of humility to do that, right? Look at the next verses in Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Solomon just told us that, right? If you live that way, you're going to hate your life. It's going to be a bad days for you. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of, you, each of you to the interest of your others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. A good day, loving your life, means in humility, I think and treat others the way God wants me to treat them. I'm thinking about the people in my life. And I'm serving them, not selfishly, rather. But see, I'm loving them. Does that make sense? Now, how many of you have heard about the golden rule? Right? <clears throat> Do you know that there are three rules? There's the iron rule, where you think of others and treat others the same way they treat you and think of you. If you think of me that way and you treat me that way, that's the way I'm going to think of you and treat you the very same way. That's the iron rule. There's the golden rule of Jesus that says, no, you treat others how you want to be treated. You think about others the way you want them to think about you. You think about them. You treat them the way that you want to be treated. And then Paul says here in Philippians chapter 2, as we continue to grow in our unity with Christ and one another, and we have this attitude, we then move on to the platinum rule, where he says we'll put the value of their interest above our others, above our own, where we will treat them better than we treat ourselves. And sometimes we need to do that because we don't treat ourselves very well, do we, Right? But even when we treat ourselves well, we, this attitude is, what is best for them? How can I treat them better than I treat my own self? Do you see that? When we have that attitude of humility, that Christ-like attitude, then we're going to have a good day and we're going to love our life. And not one mention here of possessions. Not one mention of anything in terms of what you've, the world has to offer, right? It's all within your ability, all within my ability to determine and to decide that I'm going to have a good day and love my life because I'm going to have the right attitude 
towards other people. Isn't that beautiful? Now, that, that's in terms of our actions as well, right? Because when you, the way you think of others is the way you're going to treat them, right? The way you think of the people around you today will determine the outcome of what your day is going to be like. So it has to do with our actions. So Peter says, with the right attitude, don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. How many of our days are spent trying to get even with someone? How much time do we waste and ruin by holding a grudge or being angry or, or lashing out or won't let go of something from the past? Or we got to get payback or we're gonna, we, we plan all these conversations where I have that, oh, if I ever see that person again, here's exactly what I'm going to say, point one, two, three, sub point A, B, C, right? Oh, y'all don't do that? Okay, just me? <laughs> you never get to give that conversation except to yourself usually, right? <laughs> but this idea is that this action, so the way my attitude towards others to have a good day, loving life, good days, is that I'm going to learn to have the right actions. I am not going to waste my days trying to get even with somebody else. In fact, the Bible says that vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to us. I'm not to retaliate. I'm not to plan actions against them. I'm not to speak things against them. Here's the hard part. I can make it a good day if I can learn how to pray or think about how to bless them, how to give a blessing to their life. I didn't say this was easy. I'm speaking to me as well. But when our lives are just controlled by getting even, being angry, seeking revenge, or somebody's hurt my feelings, or someone's slighted me, or somebody's offended me, that's a bad day and you hate your life. You can never correct that out. Are y'all with me? Y'all so quiet. Either you're agreeing or you're saying, get off the subject. <laughs> I mean, this is just something to think about. How many days and time have I spent in my life doing the very opposite of this? So I can't do that. <laughs> if, anyone, if anyone had the right to seek payback, it was Jesus, right? The chapter before this, 1 Peter chapter 2, you know what Jesus, it says about Jesus? Jesus had every right to insult back. Jesus had every right to pay back, but Jesus did not hurl insults back. He did not pay evil back with evil, did he? He did this to be our, here's the word, What's it, what is it, our example. So when I want to retaliate, when I want to get even, when I seek revenge, I look to Jesus, my example, he didn't do it, and I don't have to either. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, it's really something to think about. Good days, loving life is the right attitude and the right actions. Now, what I also love about these verses, if you'll notice in verse 10 through 12, there's this word picture that's painted. You know, last week I said how to study the Bible. One way is to look at key words in a verse, and we looked at that, remember? The stones in 1 Peter chapter 2, the living stone, the precious stone, the cornerstone, the rejected stone, the stumbling stone, and how all that pointed to Jesus. It's a beautiful way to read. Sometimes we can find those repetitive words in a verse and say, ah, oh, that just lays out exactly what the person's talking about. But the Bible is also really good about word pictures, laying out words for us to paint a picture. And now he's talking about relationships. Okay, what does that mean to live a good life? days loving your life with the right attitude and the right actions well it starts with the mouth right it's what he says here's my words right there okay it starts with my mouth whoever would love life and see good days must keep what their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech so the word picture there is my mouth my mouth, I have to guard the words of my mouth. Jesus said that my words reveal my heart. The words that we have can speak power, right, or death. They can have life or death. They can speak a blessing or a curse. Our words can be used to encourage and motivate and encourage and 
to uh, build people up, to strengthen them. Or our words can be used to tear people down, to destroy them, to have rumors against them, gossip, to use it in bad ways to destroy them. How many of you have had someone say a bad, a bad words over you that were the right person in your life? Think about that. People that you held in high esteem, people you hook up, look to very highly, say the wrong words into your life, and it ruins your day. It ruins your life. Some people can say everything they want to. It just goes one ear out the other. You don't listen. But there's some people who have influence upon you. And if they say the wrong things to you, they're the right person to destroy your life. They can make you hate your life. I'm talking to enough people here this morning that probably there's some of you that are thinking right now that person in your life that said something that changed and altered the course of your life. Because the words, our words, have the power of life or death. Whoever is going to have a good day, loving life, must guard their words. Think before you... Yeah, we got it, see? Think. Put the filter on, right? Think before you speak. Say, the first word picture is my mouth. I want to have a good day. Loving life. I'm watching my words. How many of you said, oh man, I wish I'd never said that. It just ruined my whole day. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Got my hands up. To oh, I wish I'd never said that. I wish they never said that to me. Wish I could have a redo it. Ruin, I ruined a good day. Can ruin a good life. Here's a second word picture. Notice it's the feet. See what he says here? They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. See the word picture? The feet. So I'm going in one direction, right? And I have to do what? Turn around. Do you know that's the word for repent? You're going in one direction and you turn around and go in the other direction. Where my feet take me, the path of my life. If I want to have a good day loving God, good days loving God, then I'm going to be aware of where my life is headed. If I don't know where I'm going, I'm probably going to go somewhere I don't want to be. And if I'm turning towards evil and walking in evil, I can't expect to have good days. I can't expect to love my life. I must walk with God. I must walk in the path of righteousness. See that? I must walk with Him. And to seek that peace and to pursue it. A peace with God. A peace with you. A peace with my own life. When I'm at peace with God and you and myself, that's a good day. I'm going to love my life. But if I'm not at peace with God or I have conflict with others because of the wrong attitudes the wrong actions, the wrong words, the evil that's in my life, it's not going to be a good day. I'm not going to live my life. Now, this is what Jesus meant in Matthew chapter 6, right? Jesus talks about the good life. He says, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, drink, or wear. Remember that? Very famous. It's not about accumulation. It's not about food. It's not about clothes. It's not about possessions. If you're worried about all those things and that is your number one obsession in life and priority in life, then you're like the unbeliever. You are chasing after the wind. You are pursuing things that are not going to bring you a good day. If your whole life is every day getting up, what well, I'm going to eat, drink, where? Where can I get a bigger house, bigger car, better education, better job, more money, more retirement? Where can I, if that's my whole life, I'm running after those things. I'm pursuing those things, and they begin to chase after you. And instead of giving you peace, it creates more and more worry, doesn't it? You can't out-worry worry. <laughs> you just can't. It's going to create more worry. So the more you worry about the things of this life, it doesn't bring peace. It brings chasing after the wind, frustration, meaningless, vanity of vanities, and you wasting your life. Hating your life because you're caught up in that. And Jesus says, look, your father knows you need these things. But if you'll seek him first, right, your path, your feet are towards him. You will seek him with all your heart. All right? You seek him, he will give you these things. You don't have to pursue them. You have to chase after them. He'll give them to you as a gift, like Solomon said. 
Not only will he give them to you as a gift, but he'll give you the ability to enjoy them and not worry about them ever again. Do you believe that? I mean, that, that is where good days and loving life is really connected. Watching my words, watching my feet, relationship with others. And now we turn to our relationship with God, don't we? Here's the third word picture in this. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. I love this now, the picture of me living my life and God's watching. Do you know there's a phrase in the Bible said the apple, that we're the apple of God's eye? How many of you have heard the expression, apple of the eye? I just love this. To be able to see the apple in the eye of someone else means close, close contact. Eye to eye contact. It's the center point of your eye. And if you look deep into the eyes of that person in front of you, you can see your reflection back. God loves you so much. God wants you to have a good life, loving your life so much that he wants you to know when you look at him, you'll see your reflection. You're the apple of his eye. He cares for you. He loves for you. He longs for you to be in this relationship. Oh, a good day loving life is when you know God loves you that much. A good day loving God is knowing that you can go to God in just personally, and you have this personal relationship with it, and you know that when you look in there, you're going to see your reflection back in his, figuratively in his eye. He watches, he guards, he loves you, he cares for you, he's close to you. Do you see that? A good day is being close to God. A good day is recognizing your life is not being watched by God who's out to get you, but a God who's watching out for you. I've seen you young moms with your children. You're visiting with each other, you moms, and your kids are playing, but where are your eyes always going? Your eyes are always on your children, aren't they? You're, all, you're talking to each other, but man, your eyes are on your child because you love them, you watch them. That's what God does for us. A good day loving life is when I know, man, that's the way God loves me. That's the way God's watching over me. I'm, I'm going to watch my words. I'm going to watch how I treat others. I'm going to have a good attitude about life and my actions are going to be good. And, I, and I'm going to make sure my feet, because if I am knowing God is looking out for me, what does a child do when it gets in trouble with their mother or dad? Where's the first place they run? They run to you, don't they? Why do they run to you? Because they know they can get the comfort, the care, the concern, right? They know they can also get your ear, and that's the next part here, isn't it? See the word picture? The ears of the Lord are attentive to their what? Prayers. Oh, a good day, loving life, is when you know when you pray to God, He's hearing you. He's listening to you. Now, like that little child has asked for the 15th time for something, you've said no 14 and a half times. We're the same way with God, aren't we? We're still going to say no, but they're going to still keep coming to us, aren't they? Because they know you listen. They know you love them. We know not only does he hear our prayer, notice he's attentive to those prayers. He listens to the righteous. His eyes are upon you. You're the apple of his eye, right? He's listening to your prayers. You're the righteous one. So of course you want to walk, run in his direction, don't you? You want to be in his presence. You want to walk with him. You want your words to glorify God and bring praise to God and honor other people. You want your actions to be one that's going to bless people and not be retaliating against them. And you want your attitude to be that as Jesus Christ is towards us. To think and treat others the way God treats us. Isn't that a beautiful word? So much in these verses, right? You've seen one more, right? There's one more word picture. It's the face of the Lord. Because it says, whoever wants good days and loves life. It doesn't say everyone will live a good day. And everyone will love life. They don't. Only those who will do what we've just been talking about. But you can make the choice not to live for God. You can make the choice to try to live like Solomon lived. And the end result is going to be the same consequence. You're going to hate your life too. You're not going to like the end result. 
Because when we turn our back on God, the face of the Lord is against us. We have to face our accuser. We have to face the judge. We have to face the consequences. And God says, those who choose to do evil, my face will be against you. Would you rather have the look of love from the eyes of God and the ears of God listening to your prayers? Or would you rather see the face of God and the judgment that comes from rejecting the life he gives you? See, this is the choice there. Good days, loving life are all found in how we treat and think of each other like Jesus does us. And how we treat and how we love our Heavenly Father who sees and hears and blesses us beyond any ability we could ever imagine to give us good days, loving life. Amen? Amen. If you'd like to, please stand with me as we close this out. I hope this lesson's been an encouragement to you. It's hopefully made you think about some things as well. But that's what it means to be in the presence of God, really to think about this hope that's found in Jesus Christ, this grace that he brings to us. And this morning we want to end with an invitation. If you've not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, please do so today. Put your Lord on in baptism. Have your sins forgiven. Walk with the Lord. Be transformed more and more into his image so you can develop this attitude and respond the way he wants us to respond. That we can learn how to guard our words, to walk in the right direction, to really believe and trust the God whose eyes are on us, who listens to our prayers. And in accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you never have to face God as your judge. Amen? If we can help you with that in any way this morning, please respond right now as we sing this song.